Whiskey Jason here. Whiskey from the viewpoint of an American over here in Germany, tasting often rare and exotic whiskeys. Waterford Heritage Hunter 1.1. All right. So for those of you who do not know that much about Waterford, this is a distillery that was founded by Marc René. Um, if you don't know him, he actually took over back then Brookladi, sold it, had to buy um, something else, and he went to the place with, according to him, the best barley of the world, Ireland. <laughs> yeah, that's the barley hot spot of the world. The best barley is grown, according to him and many, many experts in Ireland. Okay, the, the green emerald island. So, and now what they did here was a little bit different. Before I get there, I want to start sharing my screen because um, this is something that I think is um, worthy of sharing my screen. So, very, very good. Now, um, we type in the words www. waterfordwhiskey.com. We go over here to the nice little button terroir code, and in the back of each bottle, there's a code. In this case, H-E-O-1-E-0-1-0-1. So we do notice we're at the very beginning of something here. We click enter, and then we get this Capricorn of information. Heritage Barley, Hunter 1.1. So the key facts are um, the farmer, the grower, is Tom Bryan. The owner of the farm is Bortmalt. Hmm. We'll talk about that in a second. Where are they located? The farm is called um, Dono Moor, and it's in Rat Downey. And it's the 1.1 edition. It was matured for three years, two months, six days. We'll get back to that in a second. Waterford's almost always filled up, uh, filled at 50% ABV. And there was a total of 9,046, 48 bottles worldwide. And um, it was the August 22 is when it was actually bottled. So now there's a little bit of information here that might be of interest to you and to me. And I would just make, make a little bit bigger here, pour something in my glass, and then we can talk. Now, if you've never opened a bottle of Waterford, they have these glass toppers on there. You can pull until um, it sometimes works. But the best way to do is just take your thumb like you have a little, like a beer, and you just push it open and it, ding, there's a nice little silicon seal here and it works out fabulously. So beautiful blue bottle bottles, all right? So now what we have here is um, Hunter was named after a pioneer plant breeder named Dr. Herbert Hunter. And this varietal of barley was introduced 1959. I expected 1759, no, 1959, so about 70 years ago, and was for almost two decades noted for its distinctive flavor. Now, um, it vanished from the Irish landscape in the late 1970s, and it was super superseded by, of course, more economically rewarding varietals. And um, what they did is um, Waterford went to the Irish Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine. They went to the seed bank and they were given 50 grams of this hunter varietal seeds. You can hold 50 grams basically in your hand. All right. Um, Mark Rene talked about this little tiny pouch. I, I thought it was a little bit bigger, but that's still OK. All right. So they planted it in the greenhouse. Um, they planted in greenhouse grow bags, whatever they are, and this 50 grams grew to four kilograms. And the four kilograms they replanted, and if I remember correctly, it was like 300 kilograms. And from the 300 kil kilograms they had after two years, enough to actually plant their 10 acres of their partner's Minch Maltz test site in Affy. All right, so. And then with that test successful, Hunter was sown on a commercial scale, which means even bigger, on the Lime Rich Elton series um, terroir of uh, Donal Moore, and it yielded 25.5 tons of malting barley. 
So this is kind of really cool. We take 50 grams and we can turn it into 25.5 tons. All right, so, and that's enough to fill 50 casks. All right, so um, what I think is also great about Waterford is their honesty and transparency. It said here, we were battling with the label administrators to share the truth of Hunter's historic flavors for so long, an error on another part of the label, label slipped through. So probably had to happen sometimes. Uh, Dona Moore is um, where the Hunter barley was grown, is not in County Kilkenny, but rather County Laos. Hmm, just over the border, good. Now we could listen to the sounds of the farm, no. We could look at the timeline when it was sown, when it was harvest, no. What I, what I do is I have here my nice, they have the nice little table here. Um, oh, look, Ned didn't even help here. Okay. So what we can see is it was sown on the 5th of April of 2018. It was harvested on the 8th of April, August 2018. The cathedral is the place where they actually have these bins where they keep, I think, 40 tons of the grain separated from every other farm. So they actually just, just looks like a, um, almost like a garage, but it's clean and they put the barley in there and just wait. And so they were added one day later after it was harvested, taken to the um, cathedral. And then um, about a half a year later, it went to the moltings. After it was malted, it took six days basically, it arrived at the distillery. A week later, fermentation started. So the fermentation um, took 169 hours. So they started distilling on the 23rd of February and finished on the 26th of February, 2019. So um, you harvest it here in April. Um, you know, sorry, you sow it in April, you harvest in August, and you actually can distill it in February, which is a normal process. So it was actually filled in the warehouse on March 1st, which is very quick. And then this is the interesting thing for me at this moment, all right? It's the marriage of casks. So we go up here and we have 9,048 bottles. We know that we have about six and a half, a good 6,000 liters of juice. All right. So it's got to be more. It's 50 casks, 50 casks times 200, about 10,000 liters. All right. Let's go for 10,000. So you have 10,000 liters originally. After Angel Share, you might only have um, much less than that. This is a big stainless steel tank that they married it in, which is great. But I really thought it was interesting that the, that's where the aging process stops. Usually on a bottle of single cask whiskey, what will I see? I will see the day distilled and the day um, then um, bottled. And I would say, yay, this whiskey is that old. Not true. Jason, yes, no. The whiskey stopped aging at that moment you take it out of the oak cask. Same for Scotland, same for Ireland. Ireland has a particular little moment that if you take that oak cask and take it off the island, and it's no longer, I think it's actually no longer in a bonded warehouse in Ireland, um, it's no longer aging. Yes, it's going to age, but you can't put it on the label. All right, so um, that moment where we marriage uh, those casks together, that's when the aging stops. Actually, the, the date should be on the bottle better of the uh, disgorging of the casks rather than the bottling date. All right. And then between the 5th of May and the 23rd of August, it sat in that tank and mingled, married, became one. I like that. That's good. That's a long time. Usually it's a week or two. Here we have May, June, July, August. Ah, over three and three and a half months, which I think is amazing. All right, we can actually see where the farm is. So if you know what where um, Ireland is, so down here we have Waterford Distillery. Up here we have the farm. So you can see exactly where that is. We see the line here with um, the different counties as well. All right, so you have the the soil. We don't need that. Um, we do know that they basically at Waterford um, at that time always used Maori distillers yeast. I'm not even sure if that's changed. And we have 169 hours of fermentation. This is information overload. I'm sharing it with you because I am so excited that they share it with us as well. 
All right, so they have the spirit profile. I will disagree with this. I think this is the new make spirit profile, but it might be the spirit that they bottled. I don't know. It would be good to know. A lot of floral, a lot of grassy, a lot of fresh fruits, a lot of dried fruits, a lot of malt, a lot of pepper spice, a lot of oily body, a lot of finish length. Not that cereal, not that grainy, not that sweet, a little herbal, a little bit earthy, definitely not any hay or barnyard, Faint, fainty, uh, solvent, or clove, no. It's very, very interesting that that's their tasting wheel here. All right. So now what I'm going to talk about is one last thing, the oak cast that were used. All right. So every single time I've talked about Waterford, I've complained about one thing. The D N casks, the de natural. All right, so this could be a port cask, this could be a sherry cask, this could be a wine cask, this could be a revazal cask. This is a fortified French wine that's very sweet, very a little bit like a Zaltan, but just different. This is what actually creates the flavor of the whiskey I'm tasting more. Sorry that I'm saying this than the barley itself. Now, this whiskey showcased the barley, and yet it's absolutely covered, absolutely buried underneath these Reveza casks, which I think is a shame. All right, so now I'm going to go back to the this number in a second. All right, so these are Bariks. So we have 233, 215, 222. Then we have here our virgin oaks from the Speyside Cooperage. So 203, 200, 202, 202, 200. And then we have our first fill. Really interesting. We have first fill US, first fill US, US first fill. My OCD really wants to make this have first fill US as well. Very, very interesting how uniform the casks are. 195, 199, 199, 199, 199, 200.01. 197, 204, 197, 199, 199. To say that a standard US barrel is 200 liters is fairly, fairly, fairly exact. All right, so 202. And then they have these nice little um, French premium oak casks from the, um, so what was it called here? Wait a second, my friend wrote that down here. So he wrote down that they are from the uh, Chateau Palmer. Yes, that's what that was, Chateau Palmer. All right, so 220, 223, 222, 223, 221. Very, very uniform. So these are new French oak casks. So we have a composition of first fill, 45%, virgin oak, azimeric, from US, 18%. Premium French, 21%, and the stupid Vin du Natural, in this case, Grevesal. Now, if I go back up here, something really bugged me, and it took me a moment to understand what was going on. Why did this Grevesal cast only have 136 liters? I thought about this. Like, why? Was it a smaller cast? Don't think so. I was like, oh, Jason. Um, I just recently had a cast that I filled up. I bottled myself, or I let have bottled. And at the very end, I had 42 bottles and a half of a bottle. And they basically filled up the 50-some cask, or 50 casks, and what they had left over was 136 liters. So we distill it, comes off the still at 73%. It used to be actually that they would mention where it came off the still at. They don't do that anymore, do they? Nope. And um, they usually fill it up in the cask at 63.5, so they add water. And so, um, yeah, there's just not enough spirit because you can't mix the next batch together. It is a single farm. That's why that was that. All right. Very, very good. So that's all that information that I'm going to give you and can give you. Now, on the nose, this is a little funky. There is a Zoltan. There is a little bit of a... Um, shoe polish moment and a little bit of furniture polish. It's it's weird. And I was going, oh, oh, that's the barley. Until I remembered that I actually have a, what is this, Jason? This is from Scotland. What are you doing? This is a finish from Revisal casks. Now, originally I thought I'd just compare it to another Waterford, a Cuvée, but 
No, nope. I'm going to compare it to a um, another Revizal cask. And I think what I'm actually tasting is not the barley. I'm so sorry. On the new make, I could probably taste it, but the Revizal casks are so prominent that I just don't do. I don't get that barley moment there, which is a shame. Which is a freaking shame. All right. So, um, if I smell, yep. Ah, very similar. Does it have to do with the barley? No. Does it have to do with the fact that we have a majority of an influence from the Rizal casts? Yes. And that's what's, after being so excited and about being so enthusiastic about the transparency and about the process of growing from 50 grams to 25.5 tons um, and enough to make 50 barrels worth of that. And then to notice that this entire experiment has been, I'm going to use the word tainted by the use of casks that dominate the flavor. If, 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 if what Waterford would one day say, hey, we are only going to use first fill bourbon cask or refill bourbon, yay. And then we have special things where we can try other things. Why not? Now, if you go back to that list, um, it says there's only 26 barrels that have been used. If you go then to um, the website, it says 50 barrels were filled. Where's the rest? This is 1.1. So after a year or two or whatever, there's hopefully going to be a 1.2. And then they'll fill that up and we can actually compare and see what's going on. So the question is, what is this bottle worth? It goes over here for Ger in Germany for about 74 euros and 80 cents. Oh, that's not right. It goes for 80, 82. That was one, one, one shop had it on sale for 74. Everyone else is 84. I don't know what happened there. All right. So, yes, 9,048. Now, if I try this, I do like the flavor. If I were just talking about the nose, it's weird. It's grassy. It's a little bit funky. It's a little bit out there. And I'd give it like a C minus D plus on the nose. But then I taste it. Mm. A very, very unique flavor profile. Grass. Honey. Almost graham crackers. The alcohol. Well done. The three years and a a couple of weeks, I don't notice the youth really. Um, oh, what I did not do in my German video was actually dilute it down. Let's take it down to forty percent. Let's see what happens. This is the whiskey I would actually go back to and drink time to time. A long, oily finish. It is a little bit different, in my opinion, than many many whiskeys I've had otherwise. But it is a good whiskey to taste. Not a great whiskey to nose. Now, if I go over here, oh, I want to try this first again with water. I, I'm really trying to I'm trying to focus in on this. It has a little bit of a seafood seasoning aroma. Um, Chesapeake Bay crabs and that spice you'd put on those crabs. I don't know what that is, but that's what I'm getting a little bit here. Mm. Mm. It's unique. It's actually better 50% than it is with water. There's a little bit of bitterness, a little bit from that tann tannins, a little bit from that French oak that comes through that I'm not partial to there. All right. Um, yeah. Just to prove my point, 
I'd like to go over here and try this. I must commend Waterford on one thing. So far in my journey with Waterford, I have never had, I've tried maybe 12, 14, 15 different Waterford products so far, never had any type of problem with sulfur. Now this, I smell sulfur a little bit. And I definitely taste the sulfur, but I get an interesting, very, very strong overlapping of the Rivezal. And then that, that yuckiness of the sulfur at the end. Um, this and every other product from Waterford have been clean, been great. They, they really, really uh, invest the money in the right cask and apparently don't take any with sulfur. They have people that are sulfur detectors there, not like other places, unfortunately. Um, this, as taste, is for me almost a C plus. Value for money, it is a three-year-old whiskey. It is 80 to 84 euros a D. And that's specifically why, because that's specifically due to the reason that I cannot, at this moment, identify the difference of the barley. Those Rivizal casks really did a doozy on this, and that's what I'm getting. I'm sure the new make tasted different. I just do not like the cask proportions being used at Waterford. And I'm going to continue to say this until someone listens to me. Ned, I know you watch some of these videos sometimes and everyone else there. This really screws up what we want to hear see experience sorry all right so that's that my question of the day is terroir is it real does it matter where we plant it and even more importantly in this case does it matter what type of barley do we plant now we in america have bourbon and we have a mash bill even a rye is often a mash bill. We don't doubt that a high rye tastes different than a low rye. We know those ingredients matter. Now, the question is, does it matter if I have the Hunter barley or if I have Golden Promise or Conchato or whatever else? Does that really matter? Does the flavor come through the distillation process? Mark Rene would say, idiot, of course it does. That's why I'm doing this. He's invested his life, his money, his passion, everything into this because he's a firm believer. I don't doubt that he believes. The question is, do you? Do you believe that terroir makes a difference? Do you believe that the varietal of barley that is used makes a difference? I definitely know the casks make a difference, but sometimes the casks are so loud I can't actually hear the softness of the barley talking to me. <clears throat> That's it for me. Whiskey Jason here. Whiskey from the viewpoint of an American over here in Germany tasting Heritage Hunter 1.1. All the best. Bye-bye.